Good morning. My name is Nicole Hassebrook, and um, I'll be reading this morning from the book of Ephesians. Um, if you'd like to follow along while we read, it's on page number 1815 in the Blue Bible. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, nat we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Well, good morning. Uh, before I head into the sermon, let me just say thank you to the many of you who've reached out to our family this week. Uh, Debbie's mom passed away on Thursday, and we just appreciate the prayers, uh, the condolences, and just uh, all the love. So on behalf of Debbie's family, thank you so much for that. I've been praying for a little over a month now about what to preach this morning. Uh, I knew this would be the Sunday of our annual celebration and vision meeting. Um, and for me, this always feels like just an important Sunday um, for us to think about our church and our vision and mission, uh, where, where God has brought us and where we are headed. Um, and I had a few different ideas of things I would like to share. Um, I wrote multiple sermons, actually, for this morning. I'll only preach one of them. Um, hold your applause. Um, <laughs> but I ended up landing on a sermon that I preached eight years ago. It's a sermon from Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, it's a sermon I preached in 2016. Uh, some of you may have been around at that time. Uh, I actually preached this sermon when I was candidating to become the new lead pastor of our church. And it's just a passage that I think particularly points to uh, the church in a very informative way, in a very critical way for us to understand the local church, uh, which is why I preached on it then and why I think it's appropriate to preach on it this morning. Uh, I have revised it a bit and updated it from the first time I shared it, um, but if any of it feels familiar, that may be why. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10 gives this vital perspective on certain aspects of the church and what a church's vision ought to be, um, ought to include anyhow. Many of us have been praying for Vision 2024. In fact, if you look in your bulletin, you'll see the prayer letter is in there this morning. Perhaps some of you got it Friday in the email. Uh, each month, we've been sending those out for quite a few years now, just wanting to be a prayerful church, praying for the ministries and praying for direction and, and going right to God with that. So sort of an intentional prayer effort together as a church family. Um, and one item that we always try to include each month uh, is this statement. Let's keep praying that Ephraim Bemidji will become more and more the church that God would have us be. We're really looking for his leadership. This is his church. And we're looking to do things his way and be the church he would have us be. And so we're intentionally praying that way. Vision 2024 has to do with Ephri Bemidji's 100-year anniversary. If you're newer to our church, maybe you haven't heard about that yet or haven't realized the connection there. Um, but this year, by God's faithfulness, uh, we will celebrate 100 years as a church. Uh, and that's quite a milestone. Quite, quite a thing to consider. Uh, 
and something to praise God for, for his goodness, for his faithfulness, that by his sovereign providence, he has kept this fellowship of believers for all these many years, and we hope and pray and trust it will be for many years more. So as we look at Ephesians 2 this morning, we're going to look at it through the lens of Vision 2024, and we're going to consider this biblical text and what it has to say to us, how, how it wants to influence our perspective on what it would mean to become more and more the church that God would have us be. And so with that in mind, would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for our church family, that we can rejoice together, that we can mourn together, that we can grow in our faith together. And as we come to this text this morning in Ephesians 2, we just pray that you would give us insight into this passage, what it means, what was happening in the lives of the Ephesian church, but then what is happening in our church, how we should apply and live out these timeless principles and these important priorities. So we ask you to help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. In Ephesians 2, Paul teaches us something very important about the church. The church is designed to be a grace community. These gatherings of people in local churches all around the world, there are local churches, hundreds and thousands of them even in Minnesota, but around the world, local churches all over, and they're intended to be communities of Christ followers who rally around one central idea the person of Christ, the work of Christ. And to put it another way, we're all saved by grace through faith in Jesus. All of us are saved the same way, no matter who we are, where we are. We're all saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. A grace community church remembers what it's like to be spiritually lost. Ephesians 2 begins, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Now, we're not in the middle of an Ephesians series, and we really should be reading chapter 1 before we come to chapter 2, but in chapter 1, Paul goes on and on into great detail about the immense riches that we have in Christ. It'd be a chapter worth reviewing today. But after reviewing those riches in Christ, then in chapter 2, Paul takes the believers back in time gives them this sobering reminder of their lives before Christ, before they had experienced the riches of God's grace. He's reminding them, causing them to reflect back. This community of people who'd been saved by grace are being reminded why they needed grace in the first place. Verses 1 and 2, Paul reminded them, you were dead. That used to be you dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. He describes this time in the past when the Ephesian believers were walking around dead, spiritually dead, apart from the life of Christ, separated from the life of Christ. And in verses 2 and 3, he describes this not-so-enviable past you followed the ways of this world. You followed the ruler of the kingdom of the air. You gratified the cravings of the flesh and followed its desires and thoughts. They used to follow the world system, live lives that fit in with the culture of their day, with the worldly trends of their day. You used to follow the ruler of the kingdom of the air, which is a reference to the devil. That's who the ruler of the kingdom of the air is, the devil. Before they began to follow Jesus as their Lord, they were following the devil as their Lord. And he was leading them away from God, 
astray from the life God would have them live, leading them in sinful rebellion of ungodliness. They used to gratify these cravings they would have of the flesh, cravings that were born into them in the sin nature that was inherent. Rather than following Jesus, they would follow these sinful ways, their own desires, their own thoughts down these wicked pathways. Whatever part of destruction sin would lead them toward, they would move toward that. And Paul doesn't get specific here, but each different believer in Ephesus probably would remember, just like you and I might remember as we think of our past, our own personal lists of sins, our own going astray, our own disobedience. Paul ends verse 3 with this intensely sobering reminder. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's what we deserved. Our personal sin makes us subject to God's wrath. Each one of us deserves to be punished for that sin. In God's justice, it would be appropriate and right, even good, for that punishment to happen. And if it were not for Jesus' perfect sacrificial death on the cross, it's what would have happened. We'd each face God's righteous wrath on our own. But for the good news of the gospel... Through faith in Jesus' death and resurrection, each person is offered this opportunity to escape God's wrath, to have a new life in Christ. Now, some of you grammar geeks might have already noticed what just happened here in verse 3. For the rest of us who aren't quite so geeky, uh, verses 1 and 2, Paul has been saying, you. But then in verse 3, he switches it to we. We. Paul readily includes himself in the all of us. So he's not just preaching at them, he's preaching to himself as well, including himself. What Paul wants these Ephesian believers to remember, and what every believer here today, what we need to remember, is that at one time, like the rest, all of us used to be under God's wrath. As Paul reminds these believers of their own troubled past, It should also remind every one of us of the troubled present for those who do not yet know Christ. Paul uses three time-related phrases. He begins in verse 2 with used to live. Then he says now at work. And then in verse 3 he says at one time. You see how now at work is sandwiched between those? Now at work. It's important we catch the ramifications of that phrase. This former reality for the Ephesian believers is the current reality for anyone who is apart from Christ. It's current reality for anyone who's listening to this message right now, who is not yet trusted in Christ. If that is us, then we are still under God's wrath. That is what awaits us in the future. The current reality for anyone who has not yet received salvation through faith in Christ is sobering. And this should not only be sobering for those of us who may still be spiritually lost, but it should be sobering for those of us who have been rescued from God's wrath. It should give us pause should make us think. A Grace Community Church remembers what it's like to be spiritually lost. I once was lost, but now I'm found. But I once was lost. How can we not be deeply concerned? How can we not be deeply burdened and passionate for the spiritually lost to find salvation, those who have not yet been rescued, transformed. And this reality should inform the vision of any church 
Vision 2024 absolutely must include a vision for reaching the lost who come into this building looking for hope, looking for life, looking for salvation. As a church, we must be ready to welcome in anyone who is coming here to find Jesus. And Vision 2024 absolutely must include a vision for reaching out outside of these walls. Because not everybody's going to come in this building. As nice as I know you folks are, there are some who will not come in these walls. So we need to be salt and light in our community, among our family, our friends, those we work with, we need to get outside these walls, carrying the gospel to our community and to our world. After this very sobering reminder in verses 1 through 3, Paul then reminds the Ephesian believers of the incredible love of God towards sinners. He goes on in verses 4 and 5, a grace community church celebrates, reveals, and shares the riches of God's grace. And Paul says it this way, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So in this stark contrast to the sin and the death and the wrath that Paul has just talked about, he now moves to this vital reality of God's great love for sinners. That is God's heart for the lost, his rich mercy, which makes us alive with Christ. There's actually an interesting Greek construction in here. It uses a noun fo uh, form of the word love and a verb form of the word love in the same phrase. So in some of your translations, it may read something like this, God's great love with which he loved us. The point is the love of God the great, deep, immense love of God, central to this passage and central to the gospel. You see, we have a God who is especially fond of sinners, a God who loves rebels, who pursues them and goes after them and loves them when they don't deserve it, when they deserve his wrath, he goes after them with his love. That is the heart of God, and that is the heart we want to have as a church, to share God's heart. This is demonstrated in the fact that God's great love preceded our salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Verse 5 says, God made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. So listen up. All you sinners, hear this. God is especially fond of you. The riches of God's incredible grace should be celebrated in the vision of any church. Our local church, the gathered community of believers, we would be nothing if it weren't for God's amazing grace. There would be nobody here. There'd be no point to meet. There'd be no reason to gather. Vision 2024 should include a deep theological grasp of God's grace and a joyous celebration of God's grace, which changes everything for the believer's life forever. At the end of verse 5, Paul declares, it is by grace you have been saved. But Paul actually is getting ahead of himself here. Translators have tried to figure out what to do here because the thought that drops in here, it's, it's too early for this thought. Later on, a couple verses later, Paul will transition more smoothly back into this topic of grace. But it's almost like he just has to blurt it out. He just can't wait for the... He's getting to this point, but before he's even quite to the point, he throws it in anyhow. That's the sense here if you look at how the text breaks out. Paul wants to get there as quickly as he can to proclaim the marvelous grace of God. 
He actually interrupts the flow of his own thought. So excited. Then once he blurts that out, then he does return to his flow of thought, and we see that here in verse 5. It contrasts being dead in transgressions, and then verse 6, being raised to life with Christ. So verses 6 and 7 go on, and God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we are raised up to new life. We're raised up from spiritual death. We're seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. And the idea here isn't so much about a physical location as it is about a relational location. Our relationship with God is changed. Instead of being under his wrath, we are now raised up with his son, Jesus, given life. We're transformed from walking around alone in spiritual death, to being seated with Christ in spiritual life. Now, verse 7 uses an interesting phrase here, in the coming ages. Notice that it's in the plural. So it's not referring to one particular age, it's more broad ages. Paul is talking about things that are already happening in his own day and age, but also things that would come in the ages ahead. He's making it clear that in the days to come, even up to our own age right now in this day in Bemidji, God is demonstrating the riches of his grace. Continuing to do that age after age after age. It's a Bible scholar named F.F. F. Bruce. He puts it this way. Throughout time and in eternity, the church, this society of pardoned rebels, is designed by God to be the masterpiece of his goodness. So our church not only celebrates this grace, but we reveal the riches of God's grace to the watching world. When they look in and see E. Free Bemidji, we are a demonstration of the grace of God. As imperfect and broken and messed up as we may still be trying to figure out life in Christ, we demonstrate these rich graces. Verse 7 says that the incomparable riches of God's grace show forth through us as we encounter the kindness of God. As a gathered corporate community of Christ followers, we are a shining demonstration of God's amazing grace. If you turn your Bible one page to Ephesians 3.10, it won't be up on the screen, but it later talks about the manifold wisdom of God being made known through the church. Ephesians 3.10. The manifold wisdom of God being made known through the church. We are meant to be a lighthouse of God's grace in a spiritually dark world. In verses 8 and 9, Paul then further defines grace. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Paul goes real quick here. Rapid fire succession, three negatives in a row. Salvation is not from yourselves. Salvation is not by works. No one can boast about their salvation. It's almost as though salvation were a free gift. Because it is. Our salvation is a gift that we have been given by a God who loves us. Paul doesn't leave any room for confusion. He doesn't leave any room for bragging. In the same way that all of us were deserving of God's wrath in verse 3, so also all of us can be saved from God's wrath in verse 8. Saved by grace through faith in Christ. And this reality 
as it soaks in and we rethink about these ideas again, the reality of our mutual, desperate need for grace should compel us to share the riches of God's grace with others. Share with the spiritually lost in our community. Should fill us with empathy, with spiritual passion for those who are still walking around in darkness. The gift of our salvation is not a gift to be hoarded or kept to ourselves. God is rich in grace. This is a gift that is meant to be shared. There's plenty to go around. Why do you think Paul decided in Ephesians chapter 2 to remind the Ephesian believers of these things? Suppose we can only speculate but I know why I need this reminder. Because it is all too easy for me, after many years of enjoying the riches of God's grace, to just settle into my happy little Christian bubble. To just be happy and content with the love of God. After a number of years of following Christ and enjoying his grace, there's a tendency for any one of us to fall into that. Fall into a pattern of complacency, to lose our gratitude, to forsake our first love. Over time, we can lose our perspective on the gospel that saved us. By the way, this doesn't just happen to individual believers. This sometimes happens to entire churches. In fact, it happens in churches that have been around for a long time. I don't know, maybe even a hundred years. It can happen. May it not be true of our church. We can become so comfortable with God's grace and his blessings, we can lose touch with the lost and broken world around us. We can become so happily occupied, enjoying our cozy little holy huddle in our nice, beautiful, big church building. It's so nice in here with the music and the snacks and all my friends. And those are good things. Those are rich blessings. We should enjoy them fully. But sometimes in the midst of that, we can lose sight of our Great Commission mandate. The mandate to which Jesus called us. We dare not forget our gospel mandate. The reason that God placed our church on this corner in Bemidji is to make disciples of all nations. It's been said that ships are safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are for. While there are certainly times when a ship needs to return to the harbor for rest and restoration, if a ship begins to linger too long in the harbor, stay over more and more nights and kind of stay in the harbor longer and longer, it begins to lose touch with what it was built for, with what it was designed to be and do. Begins to lose vision for why it was made. What is it that unites a local gathering of Christians on a Sunday morning? What brings us here? Had nothing else going on, so we all just showed up. Perhaps it's a shared theology, a common morality, a nice social club. Perhaps many of us would say that we are united by being saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And I could get on board with that one. But this morning we need to keep in mind that any gathering of Christians should also be united 
by a sobering remembrance of our once lost condition. At one time, each one of us was dead in our sins. We were following the ways of this world. The devil was leading our lives. There's a famous quote by a Christian martyr named John Bradford. He exclaimed these words one day while he was watching some criminals who were being led away to their execution. They were about to be punished for their crimes and they were walking along, headed to their execution. And as he was standing there, he said these words, but for the grace of God, there goes John Bradford. But for the grace of God, I'd be right in that line with him. See, John had a keen remembrance of his own sinful past. He had a humble awareness of his own present spiritual good fortune. He didn't take God's love and mercy for granted. Any of us who've been become part of this grace community, become part of the church, should be quick to join him in saying, but for the grace of God, there go I. Would you say that with me? But for the grace of God, there go I. Grace Community Church is created to do good works. Verse 10 says, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We talked about this just a couple of weeks ago in our series on Romans, how God has not only prepared good works in advance for us to do, but he has given us spiritual gifts and called us to spiritual ministries. That's how we stay on mission with God. It's how we find our purpose in this world. Until we get to heaven, We want to be on mission with God and his purposes. But what exactly does Paul mean by good works? He isn't very clear here. He doesn't give many specifics. He just expects us to figure it out. One thing is clear, though. (laughs) Whatever these particular good works might be in the lives of individual believers, none of us is given a pass. None of us is given the option of being idle or lazing around until the Lord returns. We are called to action. There's no place in the local church for any of us to be resting on our laurels, to be distracted by running after the things of this world. Instead, we should be seeking after whichever particular good works God has prepared for us to do, and then when we discover what those are, we should do them. I want to invite our worship leaders up for our closing song. Rather than me closing in prayer uh, and leading us in prayer, I want the song to be our closing prayer together. The Evangelical Free Church of Bemidji started back in 1924. It's a small little Sunday school class meeting in a one-room schoolhouse. And out of that small little grace community, the Car Lake Bible Chapel began. Throughout these past 100 years, there's been energetic service to the Lord. There's been Christ-like leadership. There's been heartfelt worship. There have been believers faithfully giving their tithes and their offerings. And there have been multiple building projects. All of that through the history of our church. E. Free Bemidji has become the church that it is today because of all those things. And today we're here on the corner of Car Lake and Washington. So here's a closing question for us to consider. Are the best days of E. Free Bemidji behind us or ahead of us? And if I were to answer that question, I'd answer it the same way I answered it eight years ago. I sure hope that it's some of each. 
God has been so faithful to do so many great things in the past history of our church. And I trust that he has more ahead for us. Jesus has not returned to take us home yet. There must be something more to be done. So let's prayerfully figure out what that is. And let's do that. Let's stand together and sing our closing song as our closing prayer.